Ectopic Pregnancy Classification Of ectopic pregnancies, nearly 95% implant in the fallopian tubes vary segments. Non-tubal ectopic pregnancies compose the remaining 5%, an implant in the ovary, peritoneal cavity, cervix, or prior cesarean scar. Multifetal pregnancy contains one conceptus with normal uterine implantation and the other implanted ectopically. This is termed a heterotopic pregnancy. Fallopian tube. The ampulla is the most frequent site for implantation. Ismic implantation, the most common and earliest to rupture by six weeks, is ismic implantation. Fimbrial implantation and interstitial implantation least common. Last to rupture is interstitial pregnancy by 12 weeks. Ampullary and fimbrial implantation are prone to tubal abortions. Regardless of location, D-negative women with an ectopic pregnancy are given anti-D immunoglobulin. In first trimester pregnancies, a single intramuscular 50 or 120 microgram dose is appropriate. Later gestations are given 300 micrograms. Risk Factors The most common cause of tubal pregnancy is salpingitis. Surgeries for a prior tubal pregnancy, for fertility restoration or sterilization, conferred the highest risk. After one prior ectopic pregnancy, the chance of another nears 10%. Paratubal adhesions that form salpingitis, appendicitis, or endometriosis also raise chances. Infertility and the use of assisted reproductive technologies to overcome it are linked to increased ectopic pregnancy rates. However, some methods more efficiently prevent intracavity implantation, and with their failure, ectopic implantation is favored. These methods are tubal sterilization, smoking last with any form of contraception, the absolute number of ectopic pregnancies declines because pregnancy is effectively prevented. Pathogenesis and Potential Outcomes With tubal pregnancy, because the fallopian tube lacks a submucosal layer, the fertilized ovum promptly burrows through the epithelium. The zygote comes to lie near or within the muscularis, which is invaded by a rapidly proliferating trophoblast. Potential outcomes from this include tubal rupture, tubal abortion, or pregnancy failure with resolution. Types of ectopic Acute Acute ectopic pregnancies are more common, produce a high serum beta-human chorionic gonadotropin level, and grow rapidly, leading to a timely diagnosis. These carry a greater risk of rupture. Chronic With a chronic ectopic pregnancy, abnormal trophoblasts die early, and thus serum beta-human chorionic gonadotropin levels are negative or are low in static. Chronic ectopic pregnancies typically rupture late, if at all, but commonly form a persistent complex pelvic mass. This sonographic finding, rather than patient symptoms, often is the reason that prompts diagnostic surgery. Rupture ectopic Tubal rupture Tubal rupture is predominantly common in ismic and interstitial implantation. As the ismic portion is narrow and the wall is less distensible, the wall may be easily eroded by the chorionic villi. Ismic rupture usually occurs at 6 to 8 weeks, the ampullary one at 8 to 12 weeks, and the interstitial one at about 4 months. Depending upon the site of rupture, it's known as intraperitoneal rupture. This type of rupture is common. The rent is situated on the roof or sides of the tube. The bleeding is intraperitoneal. Extra peritoneal rupture, intraligamentary. This is rare and occurs when the rent lies on the floor of the tube where the broad ligament is attached. It is commonly met in ismic implantation. Clinical presentation. The classic triad of symptoms of disturbed tubal pregnancy are abdominal pain, preceded by amenorrhea, and lastly, appearance of vaginal bleeding. Clinical manifestations of ectopic pregnancy typically appear six to eight weeks after the last normal menstrual period, but may occur later, especially if the pregnancy is at an extrauterine site other than the fallopian tube. Amenorrhea Short period of six to eight weeks, 
Usually, there may be a delayed period or history of vaginal spotting. Amenorrhea may be absent even. Abdominal pain is the most constant feature. It's acute, agonizing, or colicky. Otherwise, it may be a vague soreness. Pain is usually located in the pelvis and may be diffuse or localized to one side. Pain tends to present between 5 and 7 weeks of gestation as the tube becomes sufficiently distended. Vaginal bleeding may be slight and continuous. Expulsion of desidual cast may be seen in 5% of cases, and vaginal bleeding associated with ectopic pregnancy is typically preceded by amenorrhea. Shoulder tip pain, 25%, may be present. Referred pain is due to diaphragmatic irritation from hemoperitoneum. Vomiting, fainting attack. Syncopal attack, 10%, is due to reflex vasomotor disturbances following peritoneal irritation from hemoperitoneum. Signs. In general look, some of the diagnostic features are as follows. The patient lies quiet and conscious, perspires, and looks blanched. The patient looks pallor, which is severe and proportionate to the amount of internal hemorrhage. Features of shock, such as pulse is rapid and feeble, hypotension, cold and clammy extremities are noted. Abdominal examination. Lower abdomen may appear tense, tumid, and tender. No mass is usually felt. Shifting dullness may be present and bowels may be distended. Muscle guard is usually absent. Pelvic examination is less informative due to extreme tenderness and it may precipitate more intraperitoneal hemorrhage due to manipulation. The findings are vaginal mucosa appearing blanched white. Uterus seems normal in size or slightly bulky. Extreme tenderness on fornix palpation or on movement of the cervix. No mass is usually felt through the fornix. The uterus floats as if in water. Caution. Vaginal examination may precipitate more hemorrhage due to manipulation. Pregnancy of unknown location. If a yolk sac, embryo, or fetus is found within the uterus or the adnexa, a diagnosis is made. However, if no evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy is seen with a transvaginal scan, the diagnosis is a pregnancy of unknown location. So, when on transvaginal sonography, no pregnancy is visualized, serum beta human chorionic gonadotropin is to be visualized. The minimum beta human chorionic gonadotropin to visualize gestational sac on transvaginal sonography is 1,500 international units per liter. The minimum beta-human chorionic gonadotropin to visualize gestational sac on transabdominal sonography is 5,000 to 6,500 international units per liter. If serum beta-human chorionic gonadotropin is less than 1,500 international units per liter, assess serial beta-human chorionic gonadotropin every 48 hours. Rise in beta-human chorionic gonadotropin by more than 63%, it's an intrauterine pregnancy. If the rise is less than 50% or falls in beta-human chorionic gonadotropin, it is a failed intrauterine pregnancy. Rise in beta-human chorionic gonadotropin more than 50% but less than 63% than it is ectopic pregnancy. Abdominal pregnancy. The most common symptom is lower abdominal pain and bleeding. Braxton Hicks contractions are absent. Studiford's criteria for diagnosis of primary abdominal pregnancy include presence of normal tubes and ovaries with no evidence of recent or past pregnancy, no evidence of uteroperitoneal fistula, presence of a pregnancy related exclusively to the peritoneal surface and early enough to eliminate the possibility of secondary implantation after primary tubal nidation. Management. Surgery is the only treatment. Ovary pregnancy. Spielberg's criteria for diagnosis of primary ovarian pregnancy include the fallopian tube on the affected side must be intact. The fetal sac must occupy the position of the ovary. The ovary must be connected to the uterus by the ovarian ligament. Ovarian tissue must be located in the sac wall. Management. Surgical. 
ovariotomy or ovarian wedge resection, or medical management with methotrexate for unruptured ovarian pregnancy. Cervical pregnancy. The most common symptom is painless vaginal bleeding. Criteria for diagnosis are Rubin's criteria or Paulman McKellen's criteria. These days, ultrasonography criteria, Paulman's, are used. Key ultrasound findings include an echo free uterine cavity or the presence of a false gestational sac only, hourglass uterine shape, closed opening between the cervix and the corpus, ballooned cervical canal gestational sac in the endocervix. Placental tissue in the cervical canal can be noted. Management. The first choice is methotrexate therapy. Surgical management serves as a secondary option involving procedures like luxerclage followed by curatage or arterial embolization followed by curatage. Diagnosis. The diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy can be confirmed when any of the following are present. Visualization of an extrauterine gestational sac with a yolk sac or embryo, with or without a heartbeat, on transvaginal ultrasound. A positive serum, human chorionic gonadotropin, and no products of conception on uterine aspiration with subsequent rising or plateauing human chorionic gonadotropin levels. Visualization of the surgery with histologic confirmation following resection of ectopic pregnancy tissue. Management. Unruptured ectopic. Symptoms. Presence of delayed period or spotting with features suggestive of pregnancy. Uneasiness on one side of the flank, which is continuous or at times colicky in nature. Signs. Bimanual examination. Uterus is usually soft, showing evidence of early pregnancy. A pulsatile, small, well-circumscribed tender mass may be felt through one fornix separated from the uterus. The palpation should be gentle, or else rupture may precipitate, and massive intraperitoneal hemorrhage when shock and collapse may occur dramatically. Investigations for the diagnosis of tubal ectopic pregnancy Blood examination should be done as a routine for hemoglobin, ABO and rhesus grouping, total white cell count and differential count, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. There may be varying degrees of leukocytosis and raised erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Coldocentesis is simple and safe. Where sensitive transvaginal sonography or laparoscopy is not readily available, Coldocentesis is still a diagnostic alternative. Unfortunately, negative coldocentesis does not rule out an ectopic pregnancy, nor is a positive result very specific. Through an 18-gauge lumbar puncture needle fitted with a syringe, the posterior fornix is punctured to gain access to the pouch of Douglas. Aspiration of non-clotting blood with a hematocrit greater than 15% signifies ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Sonography. Transvaginal sonography is an investigation of choice. The diagnostic features are absence of intrauterine pregnancy with a positive pregnancy test, fluid, echogenic, in the pouch of Douglas, adnexal mass separated from the ovary. Rarely cardiac motion may be seen in an unruptured tubal ectopic pregnancy. Color Doppler sonography. Transvaginal color Doppler ultrasound can identify the placental shape, ring of fire pattern, and enhance blood flow pattern outside the uterine cavity. Laparoscopy is the gold standard and offers benefits in cases of confusion with other pelvic lesions. It should be employed only when the patient is hemodynamically stable. Advantages are confirmation of diagnosis removal of the ectopic mass using operative procedures at the same time, direct injection of chemotherapeutic agents into the ectopic mass when medical management is decided. However, laparoscopy runs the risk of false positive or false negative diagnosis in 2-5% to of cases. Dilatation and curatage. Identification of decidua without villi structure is very much suggestive. 
Chorionic villi that float in normal saline as lacy fronds are diagnostic of intrauterine pregnancy. Serum progesterone. A level greater than 25 nanograms per milliliter is suggestive of viable intrauterine pregnancy, whereas a level less than 5 nanograms per milliliter suggests an ectopic or abnormal intrauterine pregnancy. Management. Exploratory laparotomy followed by salpingectomy is recommended in most of the cases in ectopic pregnancy. Management of ectopic pregnancy. According to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence Guidelines, 2019. Expected management. Spontaneous resolution is likely when specific criteria are fulfilled, such as a gestational sac size less than 3.5 centimeters, the absence of a fetal heart rate, and serum beta-human chorionic gonadotropin levels below 1,000 international units per liter. In situations where patients remain clinically stable, without pain, and can attend follow-up appointments, no proactive intervention is necessary as the issue is expected to resolve autonomously. Medical management is preferred in patients meeting specific criteria, including the absence of significant pain, an unruptured ectopic gestational sac less than 3.5 centimeters with no fetal heart rate, and serum beta-human chorionic gonadotropin levels below 1,500 international units per liter and who can attend follow-up appointments may be considered for a single-dose methotrexate of 15 mg per square meter. Subsequent monitoring of beta-human chorionic gonadotropin levels on days 2, 4, and 7 is essential. A decrease in beta-human chorionic gonadotropin levels indicates a positive response. If the drop is less than 15%, the therapy may be repeated for a maximum of three doses. If the response remains inadequate, surgical intervention is considered. Drugs used in medical management include methotrexate, prostaglandin F2-alpha, mifepristone, actinomycin, vasopressin, potassium chloride. Contraindications to methotrexate. Sensitivity to methotrexate, evidence of tubal rupture, breastfeeding, intrauterine pregnancy, hepatic, renal, or hematological dysfunction, peptic ulcer disease, active pulmonary disease, evidence of immunodeficiency. Surgical management is preferred if the patient exhibits significant pain along with a gestational sac exceeding 3.5 millimeters. A detectable fetal heart rate and beta-human chorionic gonadotropin levels greater than 5,000 international units per liter, the recommended course of action is salpingectomy with complete removal. An alternative option includes salpingotomy involving incision, removal, and suture, while another approach involves salpingostomy with an incision, removal, and keeping the site open. The most preferred method is salpingectomy if only one tube is affected. Gotomy or ostomy may be required considering the heightened risk of recurrence. Note, if beta-human chorionic gonadotropin ranges between 1,500 to 5,000 international units per liter, either medical or surgical management can be offered. That's all for the video. We'll see you next time.